Hey guys, it's Edward. So today, I wanted to actually do a problem for you. Now, this is a problem that one of my clients actually got, and I have actually given out to a few of my other clients. Now, one of the most important things about this problem that I see most people get wrong is that they try to find a magic bullet solution to a lot of Leco problems that they do, especially this one. And so I thought this was a very good problem to do because a big portion of this problem is actually being able to ignore that nagging instinct that you have in your head that this could easily be solved in one fell swoop. So now let's actually try and solve this problem. I'm going to show it to you as it was presented to me. I was given an array like this and then some mathematical notation and then the words find the x that will yield the most values. Well, there's plenty of ambiguity in this problem. After all, I don't know if x is an index, if it's an integer, or if it's a float. So my first instinct in this particular case is to really just try and come up with an example to try and make sure that I actually understand the problem. Now, so let's say that x is equal to 0 and I said that x is an index. So which means that the index from 0 to 1, so does that mean that the subarray from index 0 to 1 is the most valuable. Now that doesn't really make sense because most values seems to imply that we want to grab a range of numbers. So at this point, I would have just asked the interviewer, hey, this does not make sense. If I decide that x was an index, then I'd be only grabbing elements 0 and 1. Or in this case, it would be 1 and 1.1. Now, at this point, the interviewer would step in and correct me and say, hey, x is actually any real number or any rational number that could be negative or positive. It's like, okay, well, that makes sense um, because now what we're dealing with is potentially a range from 0 to 1, 1 to 2, or maybe 1.1 to 2.1. So I need to find out all the values in between 0 and 1 that will actually be encapsulated in this range. In this case, the only value is 0. So, which means that I have one value here. Now, what about all the numbers that are between 1 and 2, which means that x is equal to 1. So, that would mean that I capture this range of values 1, 1.1, 1.2, which means that my answer is 3. And then for uh, if x is equal to 1.1, and I have the, that range of 1.1 to 2.1, then I know that I'm going to be capturing 1.1, 1.2, and yeah, I guess that's it. So the answer here would be 2. Now, the question here is whether or not the end boundaries are inclusive. Well, at this point, I would ask the interviewer this question, and then he would point me to the fact that because we have this parenthesis here, this means that it's open-ended, which means that we can get infinitely close to that range. So for instance, if I picked 1 to 2 and my x is equal to 1, then I could go all the way up to 1.999999. You, you, you get the idea. I can go all the way infinitely close to 2, but never actually have 2 inclusive in my set. So how do I actually go about solving this problem now that I have actually understand it? So let's actually try and write out our assumptions. First of all, we know that x is any real number, positive or negative. Two, we know that um, this array is not necessarily going to be in ascending or descending order. So we can say effectively random order. Um, and the reason why I can say this is because the example that is given to me or the array that was already put on the board is not in a specific order. So there's no leverage here. So that means that what we need to do is try and find out how we're gonna solve this simple solution. And this is the part where most people get wrong, that they try to jump to a naive solution right off the bat. But what I'm gonna show you is how we can go from a naive solution to an optimal one. So first things first, we want to find the dead ass, smooth brain, really, really simple solution to this. So what is the really, really easy solution to solving this? It doesn't necessarily have to be efficient. It just has to be correct. So the way we would solve this is to try all real numbers in the in existence and then test that range. So then for all real numbers, numbers assigned to X, X, and then look at the array and so then we would look at the array and then for all elements in the array plus plus if in bounds so now we do have a solution that works after all we try every number that has ever existed for the value of x and then we just test the array we will definitely get the answer and we'll find the range that will yield the most values 
Now, this is obviously very, very inefficient. After all, no one wants to try every single real number in existence. So the question that we need to ask ourselves in order to get to the next better solution is what is the inefficiency here? Well, the inefficiency here is that we are actually just trying random numbers that may not necessarily yield us better results. So in this case, I could be trying, you know, one, and then 1.0000 da 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 one, and then 1.000 da 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 two. So in other words, I'm testing like these numbers that mean absolutely nothing and do not improve my solution. Why should I keep iterating over and over the array just to try these random little shitty attempts, you know? So in other words, how do I try to reduce the numbers that I actually have to look at? So when I'm going through a problem like this and I want to cut out unnecessary attempts or unnecessary tries, I need to know what makes it inefficient or, or what makes it unnecessary. In this case, if I had took the numbers 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, da, 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 1 and 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 2, well, if I drew them out on a scale and I just said that, um, you know, arbitrarily that these two marks represented my range and I said some of these marks out here represent the numbers in the array, well, I know that slightly shifting this range here back and forth is not going to actually yield me any results. In fact, the way I would see this now that I've visually drawn this out is that I want to be as greedy as possible. That is, I want to use the elements in the array as my values of X. What this looks like visually is that I would be able to at least make sure that there's no extra wasted space on any of the bounds. So what does this mean? This means that if I made this match up on the boundary, then I know that the number at that boundary will contain at least one value of x. I don't need to try and waste my time with some boundary or interval that does not contain a value in my array. So visually speaking, we can go for a greedy approach and try every single value here. That is, we use x as a value in the array. So our improved solution would look something like this. So for all values in the array, we would do exactly the same thing. We would try, you would use, use them as a value X and then iterate right over the array. Now, as I iterate over the array, I just want to check to make sure, check if the value is in between X and X plus one, or I should say that this is an equal. And if it is, if it is we add plus plus. So this is much better because we have cut out a significant number of real numbers that actually exist. Now, this is also not as efficient. Well, why? Because we are constantly iterating over the array over and over and over again. We're constantly checking the same numbers. Well, okay, how do I make this more efficient? So let me give you an example. Suppose that we picked um, element number one as our x value. Well then either check 1.1, 1 1.2, 1 0, negative 1, and negative 1.1 to see if it's between 1 and 2. And if it is, I constantly have to add it up. Now after that, now to check 1.1. 1 .1. When x is 1.1, 1 .1, now to check if it's 1.1 1 .1 and 2.1 if it's between those bounds. And either constantly keep doing this over and over and over again. So effectively, what I have here is an n squared solution because I'm going to iterate through every single element in the array. And for each one of these attempts, I'm going to iterate through the elements in the array again. So, which means that I want to try and get this runtime down to n log n, n, or maybe even constant time. And again, we're going to ask ourselves the same question. What is inefficient here? What is actually necessary and what is not. In this case, I am iterating over the same numbers over and over and over again. This is the easy one to actually iterate and make more efficient. So with that, if I could somehow take that out, then I can at least achieve a n log n solution or an order n solution. Now, how do I actually do this? Now, n log n implies some kind of sort, whereas n implies no sorting. So after all, if I can pre-sort, and then have an n log n, and then turn this into a constant time operation, then I will have achieved my n log n solution. However, in order for me to come up with a order n solution, this would need to be constant on its own, which means that sorting would have no effect. However, I see here that it's unavoidable that I have to check every single number in the array. So which means that I am forced to either pick a n log n solution. I don't believe that a constant time solution actually exists. After all, this would mean that no matter how arbitrarily large the array size is, that I could always pick it 
no matter how big it is, and my runtime is not dependent on that. So I don't actually see that happening. After all, one of the premises is the greedy premise that I pick one element that is the boundary of my solution, which means that it is a possible value of X. So in other words, let's say that I had pre-sorted this. So sorted, this would look like negative 1.1, negative 1, 0, 1, 1.1, 1 1.2. Great. So how does this help me? Well, this means that I can actually try something like this. Um, for every single value of x, I'm going to pick this. And then I am going to keep looking until I have reached to the end of that interval, which means that it is x plus 1. Or in this particular case, if I choose x as e my negative 1.1, then my end is going to be equal to negative 0.1. So the moment I go past this, I stop looking, and then I can move up those pointers. So what does this actually look like? So if I were to pick, let's say starting off x equals negative 1.1, and then I have another pointer here. And so I have another pointer right here, right? And so I'm going to start off at negative 1.1. Now I see that negative 1.1 is within the bounds of negative 1.1 and negative 0.1 because it is equal to the left hand side. So I'm going to have my counter plus plus. And then I'm going to move this pointer over to the right side. It's going to now point at negative 1. Is negative 1 in between negative 1.1 and negative 0.1? Yes. So counter is going to be plus plus again, which means our counter is equal to 2. Then I move this right hand pointer over again. I'm at 0 now. Now is 0 in between negative 1.1 and negative 0.1? No. So which means that I am going to go over and move this left hand side pointer over to this negative point one here. So this left hand side pointer, let me mark this as blue, just for the sake of clarity. Now my left hand side pointer is going to be pointing at negative point one. Now I will also commit this value negative 1.1 and 2 as my all time record. Now if I were to come up with another result that actually overtakes this value, then I'm going to keep that as my record. So let's start again, I start off at negative one, which means my end value is zero. I'm looking at negative 1 and negative 1 as my right hand side pointer because my right hand side pointer will always start on my left hand side pointer and make and be equal at the beginning of the attempt. So my counter plus plus, so which means that counter is going to be equal to 1. My right hand side pointer goes here and now it's at 0. Is this within the range of negative 1 and 0? No, because again, we cannot be equal to the right hand side. So which means that I'll commit this value negative 1 and 1. Now I compare the two. Is 2 greater than one. Yes. So we keep our original value negative 1.1 and we just get rid of this. This is an attempt that didn't seem to work out. Let's move over and try a value of zero. And so we now try a value of X is equal to zero. If X is equal to zero, then our end value is one. Let's start with the right hand side pointer again. Is the value I'm looking at in between the range of zero and one not inclusive? Yes. So my counter plus plus my counter is now equal to one. I'm going to move my right hand side pointer over to the right. Now, is 1 in between the value of 0 and 1? No. So I'm going to commit this value again, 0, 1. Not greater than my current reigning champion of negative 1.1 with a counter of 2. So I'm going to discard this. And hopefully you get the idea. Now, I don't need to write out the code because hopefully you guys understand this, but this is still not as efficient. Why is that? Because even though we did n log n work at the beginning, we are still doing an effectively an n squared operation. Why? Because we're still looking at every single value in the array, which is an order n operation. And then for every single value, we are effectively doing a truncated order n solution because uh, our range is ultimately dependent on how big this array is. So this is still order n squared. So the number of times I shift over this right hand side pointer is dependent on n. So how do I fix this? So for people who have actually followed my guide, link in the description down below, it's completely free, it's a Google Doc, they will be able to recognize that this is a precondition for a sliding window pattern. So for people who do not know what a sliding window is, all it is is just a left pointer and a right pointer where you retain the solution in between those two pointers. And in order to get to the next possible solution, you just move the left pointers and the right pointers over. So how does this apply actually over here? So let's say that I have some values here, x, y, z, a, b, c, you know? And so let's say I have an arbitrary left pointer pointing at y, and then I have my right pointer pointing at a. Therefore, in order for me 
to actually fully accept that this is a valid case scenario where we'll continue to move the right hand side pointer the relationship must be as follows y must be less than or equal to a and a must be less than y plus one this is only if we know that a is going to be a valid number within our y to y plus one range now suppose that we hit some condition where this is not true well when would this not be true this would not be true if we have the relationship y y plus one where y plus one is greater than y which is you know it has to be strictly greater than and then you have a out here so what does this mean this means that we now have to have z be our left hand side pointer so we know that from this relationship earlier we know that if a is here that this relationship y z y plus one we know that y must be less than or equal to z and z must be less than y plus one so using a substitution we can actually see this relationship begin to form y less than equal to z which is less than equal to y plus one or i should say less than y plus one which is less than a so in order for a to remain valid within our little realm for when we picked z to be our new x that this relationship z plus one must hold true so let's consider the case where this is true well i know that if i were to use y as my boundary condition that i would have at least captured y and z which means my mapping is to a counter of two now let's bump up the left hand side pointer now the left hand side pointer is pointing to z so now i know that if z cannot be expanded out further that z is going to be equal to one and we are safe to discard this and ignore the solution because one is not going to be greater than two in fact this z must be less than y necessarily because we are shrinking the size of the window you can kind of see this here we start off with a window that's this wide and now we're shrinking the window to be this wide this wide window represents the number of elements we've captured so as an example let's say i have 1 1.1 and 5. so i know that for y of 1 i know i've captured two values but then for z is 1.1 i know i can only capture one value so intuitively, this is why the sliding window works. And I'm sorry if I kind of rambled on this, but I'm hoping that this shows you that you can actually derive this and memorize things like these before the actual solution. What I mean by this is by simply recognizing that these patterns exist and doing them beforehand. And once you immediately gain that recognition, you'll immediately be able to draw this connection without having to draw this entire explanation. And the sliding window is actually very common as well. And so anyone who is well-practiced can easily recognize beforehand that simply having a sorted array and simply reshifting the pointers over and over again on a limited solution and repeating the numbers will immediately yield itself to a sliding window. So let's actually write up a final, final solution because what does this actually look like? Let's actually start off at element zero for the left-hand side pointer. And the right-hand side pointer is gonna be equal to whatever the left-hand side pointer is. And so we recognize that this is going to be our boundary x. So now we want to make sure that we advance the right-hand side pointer while the, this core relationship holds true. That is while, while x is going to be less than equal to right-hand side value, which is less than x plus 1, then we make a counter plus plus and then advance the right-hand side pointer, pointer plus plus in its position. And so let's say that this relationship stops holding true. That is, we have finally reached our maximum right-hand side and we're out of bounds. So we want to commit, commit value and counter at max value. So this is the com max comparison that we did before. So I'm writing this as commit value and counter at max value just as shorthand. Um, and so after that, once we've committed that, then we want to advance the left-hand side pointer until this relationship holds true again. So while, while right-hand side, hand side is greater than x plus one, advance the left-hand side pointer plus plus all the way until the left-hand side pointer um, is equal to right-hand side. Now we know necessarily once x is equal to right-hand side pointer, this will eventually kick in again. Um, I am using left-hand side pointer and x synonymously here just for clarification, but this also means that potentially we could run into a situation where we have looked at the entire array and then we run the right-hand side pointer to outside the bounds. Then we want to actually try and commit whatever remaining that we haven't actually looked at. So this is a corner case that you should be very cogent of and that you could possibly run into, especially when dealing with sliding windows. So then we can try a commit, commit 
down here. I'll throw this code up on the screen for you guys, but hopefully you guys got something pretty similar. And you can see how the derivation that we have used so far has actually led us to this actual optimal solution. Why is this an optimal solution? Because the sliding window actually runs in order and time. But we do this in such a controlled manner that the most we ever do is move up the left-hand side pointer n times and the right-hand side pointer n times. But every single time we move the left-hand side pointer, we're not doing n operations on the right-hand side. In fact, it could be going back and forth. You know, we might move the left-hand side pointer up once and the right-hand side pointer up once. Um, and then, which means that we have n minus one moves left on the left-hand side pointer and n minus one moves on the right-hand side pointer. So which means that overall, the total number of moves that we can make is going to be of order 2n, which is effectively order n. So this is how we get to our runtime solution. Now, our space solution is actually going to be constant. Why? Because we're only ever holding references to the left-hand side and right-hand side pointer, and we're only ever holding this maximum value. So these are effectively four variables that we actually need to keep track of. So hopefully you can see how we went from a very simple, very naive solution of trying every single random number in the existence of the world and trying it against this array to gradually building up this solution up to just trying every single number that is in the array to then coming up with this incredibly efficient sliding window solution. So if you guys take away anything from this problem today is that you don't always get the magic right solution right off the bat. In fact, it can take a few tries, a few bite at the apple, and then constantly asking yourself what the inefficiency is and how you can overcome it in order to get the right optimal solution in the coding interview. And I think also from the interviewer's perspective, it shows that you are capable of logical, critical thinking and building up your solution. In engineering, very rarely do we ever come up with a crazy great solution right off the bat. So that'll do for me. Let me know what you think about this in the comments down below. Also, feel free to follow me on my socials where you can vote for what topic I cover next. And if you want to try and secure the next job offer, you can book me for interview coaching at eChantech.com. If you like this video, please like and subscribe, and I'll see you all in the next one.